call to order. Let's see here. And uh, for a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Your presentation. Everybody's getting what they need. 
And so, for example, at the elementary school, we have link time or what I need time, which we have. And in the past, um, interventions would take students out for tier two or tier three intervention, and the teacher would be in the classroom with the remaining students providing academic intervention, or some all the rest of the students would be there in like um, be tier one students or students that were at that higher end. Now we are using all of our resources to push into a grade level at one time. So the students at each grade level are divided up based on what they need, and they all get direct teacher instruction during that time. So students, <laughs> students that need in, enrichment might be working on um, different literature at that higher end. Students in tier one, but maybe towards that lower end are getting still getting specific skill instruction that they might need just because they don't qualify for that um, more intensive intervention, but they still have skills they need developing. They might be working with a group together. And then students within um, the middle or higher end are getting some extension activities with the core curriculum. So during that time, that's pretty much um, the big change is that everybody's getting what they need at that time and it's focusing on all students, not just the students needing intervention, but the students that we can also provide that boost to. It's that we're still in tier one and the students that need some enrichment as well. Can we just pause for a second and see if there's any questions about that? Because this, this graph, picture, picture graph, whatever it may be, incorporates all students in the classroom. Right, it incorporates everybody. So when we refer to kids as tier one, tier two, tier three, tier two plus, I don't know if that's confusing or not. It's kind of you know, new educational terms, I guess. But I didn't know whether there's any questions or. Can I just make a point of clarification? This is only for the elementary grades, or does, would this be middle school and high school as well? So the the process I just described was the elementary schools. Okay. So the interventions look a little bit different at the middle and high school. Do they still follow the same tier structure? They follow the same tier structure, correct. And the biggest difference, I would say, is in the high school, where you know they have the different classes they take, and they have to base some intervention on region scores, and it's kind of a different. Um, they don't have, they don't use a fast bridge screener for that ELA and math. They have their standards to go by. So, like, uh, like some students might be in regions track algebra, while others might be in. Yeah, I think I explained a little more. So for that for the tier one, that's just, that's every student in every classroom, right? So that's the kids that are getting the instruction in their classroom. And that's and that's tier two as well, right? You have kids that are taking reading tracks, you have kids that are taking so um, I mean every every kid really takes a reading track other than our C dot students. Um, and then you have tracks within English, science, social studies, um, where they can you know, advance through those. So for instance, a student could take algebra one, then you go to geometry, and then they could go to regions algebra two. Um, some kids will go take algebra one and they go to foundations of geometry, which is not a regents class, but that fits those type of students based on their on their, their math level. We do that with every content. Uh, we also have what we call AIS, um, and that's for based on region scores and teacher recommendation of how students are projected to do on regents and for how they've done on past years. Um, and that gives them an extra period to work with teachers one on one, small groups. Um, on standard based instruction and skills to help them on reading stuff. Um, that tier two that you're talking about, tier two plus, that's kind of that reading track, and then a tier two plus three would be our AP courses, our CAT courses, um, and all the our call level courses that we offer at the high school. So it does fit, the tier it does look a little bit different than an elementary school, um, but at the high school level, we need to fit all the tiers. If, if you were to summarize the difference, this approach versus the, the RTI. What is the big difference from the change of RTI to the MTI? So RTI was only regarding that ELA and math we were looking at, that specific response to intervention, where the multi-tiered systems of support is incorporating everything. So we have that social emotional learning piece in addition to the academic piece. So it, it's not just um, focused on only academics. Okay. I think that I might say what you're gonna say. <laughs> so the piece right here that um, is, a, is a big difference is that we're also adding um, more supports and uh, offerings for students who are already proficient in reading. When we talk about our RTI plan, we are very focused on those students, tier two and tier three students, 
who needed help, and it kind of seemed like the students who were already proficient readers and needed a little bit of a challenge were addressed in the RPI. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to make more follow up. Could you give, that? I know it's new, but some examples of some of the enrichment for the elementary that, that you are
one of the biggest focuses in the plan um, is on tier one support. Because of course we want to prevent students from needing that intervention and um, the de skill deficits that they're experiencing. So we always want to look at what can we do within that classroom in tier one and make sure those students are getting support so that they're learning at the need to or progressing as they need to. So universal design for learning is a component of that tier one instruction. And universal design for learning is recognizing that not all students learn the same. Not all students are in the same spot. We know that they learn in different ways. So we know that they all have different skills, different strengths, different areas need improvement. So we want to provide for that. We want to provide multiple ways to present material. We want to provide them multiple ways to show that they've learned and multiple ways to engage them. So that's kind of the uh, universal design for learning component. Uh, one way it was explained to us was if you were having a dinner party and you knew that some of your guests were um, gluten-free or they had allergies to certain food, you wouldn't provide everyone with the same meal and expect them all to eat it. You would provide some choices for them and a buffet of selections. I guess yeah, you might have gluten-free pasta, you might have veggie, like all different things so that our students are getting what they need and they're able to present in different ways. So instead of writing a research paper every time, maybe they can uh, do something with uh, multimedia and doing a presentation or writing a poem or di doing different things in their you know, way that they present it. Anyone have any questions about that universal design for learning? Aside from that universal design, if there are students that still need more, then they get that differentiated instruction specifically designed for that student. How, what do they need to be successful? So that's all within that tier one support that they want to be providing. Another way we are supporting tier one is our instructional coaching with Marsha Tate. She wrote this um, many books, but this one, Worksheets Don't Grow Dead Rights. And she presented her instructional strategies at the end of June and also the first day of school this year. She was very well received by staff, very engaging presenter, uh, had a lot of great strategies to incorporate in the classroom. She's going to be coming back 14 days over the course of the year and going into classrooms and providing teachers with some coaching and support and giving them feedback on um, how they can incorporate those strategies right within their classroom. So we're looking forward to that. And in addition, we also have um, Kelly Brock returning for some coaching on behavioral and social emotional strategies. So those are some of those tier one supports we want to provide. Okay, and to wrap up the presentation, we wanted to mention some of the key changes from the past plan, the RTI plan, and our MTSS plan. So there's an increased focus on tier one instruction, which um, was the Marsh Tate at EDL. We have eliminated the AIS tier, and most of those students fall under tier two support. So under RTI plan, there was tier two, tier three, and AIS. AIS students were serviced in the classroom by their classroom teachers, and then tier two and tier three students were seen by interventionists. In this new program, there's just for intervention, tier two, tier three, then, and then on up the scale. We are doing ongoing professional development to support staff in giving um, coaching opportunities with Marcia Tate. And one of the things that I personally love about um, this is that all students are getting direct instruction from a teacher during the win time. In the past, students were staying in their classroom and the students that needed extra support were leaving to be with the interventionist. So that classroom teacher might have you know, four or five different reading levels left to work with. So that meant there was going to be students that are working maybe 30 minutes on their own or 15 minutes on their own so the teacher could rotate through groups. Under this model, every child is getting some direct time with, um, with an instructor. So you know, it's just better utilization of our district resources.
resources and our people. And another great thing that we'd already mentioned is that we are focusing on providing enrichment for students that are at or above grade level. There's um, opportunities for students to accelerate, to grow, and try new things, and we're giving that to them. And we are continuing to focus on our students' social and emotional well-being with the regular screening and all of the supports that we are providing them. That's it. Does anybody have any questions for us? I have a question. What is, is there a, a plan or how do you envision sharing this information with the, the parents or the guardians of students? Is that something that will be discussed with this transition with the families? already happened at Cumberland Head. Our teachers have started their groups and they've all sent letters home to the parents saying, you know, it's so-and-so, I'm working with your child, you know, for, for this time. But we could also um, put the plan on our website and I could send out parents where they have presented our RTI plan and kind of do a little informational, I guess, short. Uh, uh, 
uh, a report, which you have in front of you, and we have to issue an opinion on that report. And in our language, we issue an unmodified opinion. So that's a clean opinion, that's what you're looking for. Uh, we met with the audit committee last week. We spent a lot of time going over the report. They asked a lot of good questions. I think that was a, that was a good meeting to have. I'll just point out a couple of things. Uh, if you have reports in front of you, I'm looking at pages 16 and 17. Um, this is good information for the board to be familiar with. Uh, page 16 shows the balance sheet of the general fund. It shows the assets, liabilities, and fund balances at the end of June. Page 17 shows the, uh, uh, the revenue expenses for the year. And it comes down to a net profit at the end of the year where revenues exceeded expenditures. That's on page 17, third line from the bottom, of 4.6 million. Uh, that was the surplus for the year. That gets added to the fund balance at the end of the year. Uh, fund balance as of June 30th was 18, a little over $18 million. If you were to look back on page 16 under the fund balance section, you'll see where some of that fund balance is being held. There are certain reserves that are in place. Uh, those, are, those are restricted for a particular use. <clears throat> the uh, balance after gain, fund balance is called unassigned. That's $10 million, okay? And that number is what's used by New York State to calculate a percentage of next year's budget to see if you're within New York State regulations. Uh, you turn to page 53, it shows that calculation. That's toward the end of the report. Uh, your fund balance was 22% of next year's budget, so that exceeds the state uh, requirement of 4%. And because of that, we have to issue a finding, which is also in this report. That finding is on page 70. Uh, we mentioned the finding, and the district has to uh, issue a corrective action, and that's in that, on that page as well of how they're going to deal with that excess fund balance. Any questions on the fund balance so far? Uh, a couple other pages I think you should be familiar with, uh, as a board, is our pages 54 and 55. Uh, these two pages, they compare budget numbers to actual results. Uh, page 54 deals with the revenue side. It compares uh, um, revenue of 42 million to actual revenue that came in with 44 million. Page 55 does the same thing on the expense side. It compares budget expenditures, which is planned on spending, to actual performance, actual expenditures. So there was a great savings in the budget this year. That's what generated. On the expenditure side, that's what generated the uh, excess of the revenue over the expenses. Uh, like I said earlier, the audit went well. We were there for about a week. No issues other than the fund balance finding. Uh, and that's about all I have, unless there's questions I can answer. Mike, can you, can you go over page 58, the um, long-term liabilities, please? Page 58. Is that the old bed you're talking about? Correct. Okay. Page 58. Uh, other old bed things for other folks and budget benefit. Okay, that is, that's the value, the present value of uh, health insurance costs, projected health insurance costs for current employees and retirees. Uh, and actually, we're decided by the district to calculate what that liability is, what that liability is. Uh, and they present value that number down to, in this case, 2021, it was $196 million. That's the value of those promised benefits for health insurance. Um, there's a significant increase from the year before. Uh, 
the actuaries, uh, they, they, they changed the interest rate, they didn't change the rate, but they fixed their interest rate was reduced based on market rates, and that had a severe impact on that liability, around $40 million, that's why it went up so much. Again, that's calculated every year by uh, an outside actuary. Any specific questions on, on that? Um, no, that, that's pretty normal. All the schools look like this, unfortunately. Um, so if nobody's funded, obviously no one can fund this. Um, but but it's a number that we have to report, and, and we're going to go 10 years out, right, Mike? Eventually? Eventually, that, yeah, that page will show 10 years at some point when we get there. Yep. We're in year four now of this requirement. Uh, there's no mechanism to fund yep. for this or state for this. Uh, it's, I think it was fun to get uh, the attention of everybody who's, you know, with that liability figure really is for these benefits that are promised. Uh, every district's got a fairly large number. Of course, it's based on the number of employees and the, and the benefits. Uh, but yeah, everybody's got this calculation done. You said that the actuaries that were chosen do it for all this, a lot of other schools in their area? I didn't get all of that. The, the actuaries that do the numbers for this, could you elaborate on who else they do the numbers for? Mike, you want me to take, did you hear that, Mike? No, I haven't that there. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Merrick's talking about the actuarial firm that does those calculations, and they actually do the calculations for each individual school district. They don't, they don't do it for the auditor. And that's Armory and Associates is our actuarial firm, and they do handle probably. I used to work with them closely before I worked here at Beacon Town, and I think they have about seventy other school districts. They're actually a Boces code. They go to a Boces code that we worked on years ago. Is that, you, is that yeah? I just want the public to understand that it's not someone specific to Beacon Town. They're an industry organization, right? Yep. Anything else, Mike? No, I, I hit the highlights that I was concerned about. Uh, unless someone has some questions, I think I'm all set. Any board members with questions? We went over this with the audit committee quite in depth, but I don't know if any other board members have any immediate questions. It's all part of the whole okay, so okay. Okay. So feel, you're in. feel free to go over there. <laughs> now, I mean Wait, she, she can start writing the audit. Well we can, we're talking about it now, so you wanna go over there or yeah, go ahead. So fundamentally what happened uh, over the last couple of years is with the changes in COVID and uh, some of the scares that we had financially from state and feds, we were strongly concerned that we weren't going to have enough budget for this particular year. And at one point, we were still not getting the money that was owed to us from the previous year. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, right? Correct. At some point. So, so not only were we not getting the money from the previous year, we weren't getting the money we were supposed to get that year, and we readjusted our budget significantly lower and had to make some adjustments. And part of the philosophy for that is that you don't want to start programs and then halfway through the middle of the year once you do get your budget suddenly you have to make a whole lot of catastrophic changes and it would be significantly challenging for the district. Uh, having said that, if you look at the revenue side budget wise, really close based on our budget what we collected from, from the uh, state the taxes it was the, rev the expense side that significantly dropped that made our, our revenue go up. Um, I think that's kind of the highlight of it. I don't know if you want to elaborate on anything else that we did. There's, all, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of factors to this, but at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, this was all hinging, our budget was hinging on the election. We thought that there was a good chance that there was going to be state aid coming in and the Democrats took office and we had watched for four years Governor Cuomo and Donald Trump go at it to the detriment of public education in, in New York. How close did that reality come of cutting us 20%? Like you said, they actually started, the governor actually started <coughs> taking money uh, from us in September that it was more than what they, they promised the 20% cut would be. How close did that come? Um, if you take a look at the federal election, I think Donald Trump <coughs> missed winning um, uh, Wisconsin by about 2,000, 3,000 votes. Had he won Wisconsin, he would have won the election. Had he won the election, there's no way New York would have received billions in aid. So it, that's how tight this thing was for us. And like you had it right, Ed, we weren't going to, and we mentioned this during the budget process, we weren't going to budget and then scurry in um, January or, or November or whenever and, and make cuts because um, the governor had for months and months and months proclaimed that this was going to happen. And in September, we knew it, was, it wasn't a threat, it was happening. You did a report on this. Did, did we leave anything out? No, no, not really. I mean, that's the key potato of it. <clears throat> on top of that, just other things that happened during COVID that um, we don't have as many expenditures because we're not doing as many things that kids usually do, like field trips and just a lot of professional development, a lot of other things that are more difficult, which all those pieces add up to a, a pretty large number. So our corrective action plan is on page seven. That's 771. Mike, thanks again for a great audit. Uh, thank you for coming to the audit committee and coming here tonight. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for allowing me to do it this way, Dan. Appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure. So, Bye. Next topic, your rifle team. Here in July, Mr. Mannix approached me um, and discussed an ELO that had been run um, or wanted to be run uh, for air rifle. Obviously, COVID got in the way of that. And I took a deep dive the last month and a half and have a, uh, some information to share with you on where we are with our uh, Deep Town air rifle program. So um, I tried to not make it too uh, in depth, but I can take any questions at the end. And hopefully, it serves as uh, informative for the Board of Education. Uh, to understand what is air rifle and what are we looking to do. So the first thing I think that is most important to discuss is what is student interest. So we put together a student interest form and we had 62 students about three weeks ago that had expressed interest in air rifle and when I downloaded the form again today we we're up to 96 um, and there are no duplicates on that list. So we have 96 students in grades 7 through 12 that are interested in participating in air rifle. So what I did on the chart is I broke down by grade level um, the interest. So if you look at 7th and 8th grade, that represents 60% of the total students interested in air rifle. And then if you add 9th grade, you're looking at close to 80% of the students interested in air rifle. So 10th, 11th, and 12th grade represent our smallest numbers. Um, but obviously 7th, 8th, and ninth grade are the future of the program and uh, obviously very, very high interest. So this definitely exceeded my expectations and I think when I told Mr. Mannix uh, 62, it was a pretty high number when we originally did our, our survey. Largest team in America. <laughs> yeah. So what is, what is 
Air Rifle. Uh, Air Rifle is a NISFA, New York State Public High School Athletic Association sanctioned winter sport. It is a co-ed sport with approximately 12 members per team. Okay, so again, think back to that number of 96 and we only have 12 on a team. Uh, grades seven through 12 are eligible. It's considered a small muscle group sport. So there's no selective classification needed to participate on the varsity level. So there's no modified GAB varsity. It's grade seven through 12 compete on one team. So that's what the APP is, the selective classification. So if an eighth grader wanted to play JV football, they would have to go through the selective classification, not with air rifle, because it's considered a small muscle group sport. Um, when they do matches, the top four scores in a match are used. And the nice thing about air rifle is there is no transportation to road events. Uh, we would not have to transport our students to matches. They do it at their home facility, and it's done on the honor system. So your top four scores would be reported on the day of the match, and that's how the scores are calculated. So it's, it's a unique opportunity. The state championships are held at West Point in their air rifle facility, um, which is beautiful. I had a chance to watch a YouTube video on that facility, um, and NISFA does um, give awards, obviously, for participants and people that do place at the state tournament. First thing, obviously, when you, you start talking about or using the word rifle, air rifle, uh, is safety. So all participants will learn and practice safety is the number one key component of the sport. Teaching students the proper way to handle equipment uh, greatly reduces accidents. So at the beginning of the year, teaching students the proper way to hold their rifle, um, to walk around with their rifle, um, and again, it's an air rifle. I had a chance, I did a site visit to the Rod and Gun Club and was actually able to shoot one of these rifles. And I would say a pellet gun feels like it has more power behind it than an air rifle gun. It's simply an air chamber that shoots the pellet. So it's not like you would think of a typical firearm. So I think that's, that's very important to understand. Qualities and values of marksmanship. Real quick question. Sir. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Is there, is there any uh, correlation between these systems versus the ones used to be off of the Olympics? Actually, the last video I have is an Olympic um, air rifle shooter talking about, I felt it was important for you guys to hear from an expert what skills are required to, that makes a good marksman. So that there's a similar weapon. Yes, yes. Um, and again, I took a deep dive the last two months in air rifle. There's three positions that the students learn to shoot from. There's the standing, the kneeling, and the laying down. The laying down is called the prone position. And if you think of gymnastics, there's scores for every event, for all four events, there's a score. And then there's an all around competition that takes place. It's the same with air rifle. You shoot in the standing, the kneeling, and the prone position. So you have an overall champion for each match. And then you have individual champions for each, or winners for each position. Which, which mimics what you would see in the Olympics for air rifle. So what makes a good marksman? Again, safety. This, this was the central theme in all of my research, is it's one of the safest of all sports because of the mechanisms that are put into place, because of the training the student athletes go through. Um, safety is the number one thing that is stressed to all athletes. It's open to all genders. Um, doesn't matter how tall you are, how short you are, how fast or slow you are. Um, it's practice and the amount of time you put into the sport determines your success. Uh, it teaches life skills. Athletes learn discipline, responsibility, and the rewards of hard work. Uh, it teaches control and respect for others. And something that really intrigued me, and I know it's something that district, district values, I see it every day in the classrooms, with the course offerings that we offer our students, is the opportunity for Division I scholarships. There are not a lot of high schools that have air rifle, and the amount of scholarships that are out there for students, um, it really opens up a whole different avenue for our students here at Deaton Town to possibly earn a scholarship. So how many college programs are there? There's 23, as you see on the screen, Division I programs, three Division II, three Division Three, and several club teams. Plattsburgh State is one of those club teams. Uh, their coach, Peter Visconti, and I have worked together quite closely over the last month and a half, um, and he shared with me a lot of really, really good information. 
he believes Plattsburgh State is close in the next year or two to becoming a full-time NCAA program. So I thought that that was very intriguing to me. That's actually a picture of his daughter, his three children. They've all signed Division One letters in the town. They go to uh, Northern Adirondack. And that's his youngest daughter signing a scholarship to a Georgia Southern. So um, that was very appealing to me to think that we could have students earning scholarships through Arrow. What do we have? Um, we did an inventory. Um, thanks, Mrs. Parliament. We worked hard at trying to find where all of the equipment was that we ordered. We were able to do that. And this is a list of all the things that we currently already have in our district. Uh, I believe that were purchased, Mr. Mannix, through ELO. ELO. The issue is, if you notice the second item on the list, rifles, eight, um, I would suggest that we order enough for 15 shooters, that we would have 15 um, pieces of equipment for each athlete, and we currently only have uh, enough for eight. So we would need to order um, a few more items. But I'm working on uh, securing a grant that is out there, which is a $2,000 a year grant that is refunded every year, which will cover the cost of a lot of our program uh, each and every year. So what does our facility look like? Uh, this are, these were some pictures I took in our site visit. Um, we purchased a safe. You can see our two maintenance and uh, workers here lo unloading the safe. And this is an actual picture of the range of the Rat and Gun Club. And you can see where the students would stand. Um, partitions are put between the students and they would shoot down um, at the targets. This is the Rod and Gun Club in Plattsburgh. This is what the scoring system looks like. Um, they put it up on, on the board. Um, and the targets that are examples of some of the top scores ever achieved are below the board. And this is what our students would see. That's a picture of the Rod and Gun Club out this way. Uh, competition, what schools compete? Um, these are the schools that we would be competing against. There are six schools. You play each school twice, so it would be a total of 12 matches. Matches start after Thanksgiving and go all the way through to March. Um, and that's when the state championships will be held down at West Point. Um, Willsboro has been very helpful. They do have an inner rifle team. It's been very successful, um, and they are the closest school to us that does currently offer air rifle. Got a call today from Plattsburgh City School District that we are interested in. Absolutely. So the schedule has um, come out, and again, it's a total of 12 matches plus playoffs. So that's how Air Rifle would work. But again, we would not be traveling to Hoosick Falls for a match or Messina. We would be doing all the Rod and Gun Club, and it's done on the honor system. Now, what do we need? Um, we need basically five more of everything, is what we currently need. Um, and that would be, I could work with Mrs. Parliament to get a number of what that would be, um, but the greatest expense would be the rifles, and I believe those are $400? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, they weren't actually. $380. Do we know what that, what are those rifles? There, there's a, a, a range. Um, you can have rifles, I've seen up to $3,000, and then some that are $199. I believe the ones we bought were $380. For hundred dollars, the top rifle is called Ranchwitz. It's a it's a German company, uh, but those rifles are are way too expensive. Mm -hmm. Three thousand dollars a piece. And, the um, company we were working with was very helpful, were very knowledgeable, um, and they were recommended. Change choice. Yes, and they were recommended by the Rod and Gun Club, and um, they actually walked me through what I needed and what to use and and all that. So they were very very helpful. It's like hockey skates. So my question on that is, obviously, this is a game of practice. If you don't have access to that gun, you're not going to be successful. Yeah, and that's the challenge. So that was my question about what my, my kids have airsoft guns. They have pellet guns. They have real guns. <laughs> Same with Mrs. Farrell. Um, <laughs> so I have a younger kid who would be interested in this. So my questions are, how much does this gun cost? And like you said, obviously, well, you're a hockey guy. An $800 hockey stick, which is not out of reason, is way better than a $200 hockey stick. 
So in this sport, obviously, practice is the key. And I'm a golfer, and it used to be, hey, it's not the Indian, it's, or it's not the arrow, it's the Indian, not anymore. It's the arrow. So the question is, like, do they have like a level playing field where everybody shoots the same gun? Or if you have a $2,000 gun, you're going to be the guy with a $400 gun. Yeah, Coach Visconti talked about how students will buy their own guns if they really get into the sport. Um, like your daughter has one of those high-end rifles. Um, does that make a difference? I think it would. Um, obviously, for us, we were looking at starting an ELO, so we weren't looking at the competition rifles. Um, but I think, obviously, you would see as we go on, uh, what can we do to offer our kids the absolute best I was shocked when I saw 62, and then I looked to see 96. Uh, the interest is through the roof, um, but again, it does come down to quality of rifle. Does it matter? I, I think every time you have better equipment, it would help your results for sure. My next question on that, if you don't mind me asking, is again, I have a kid who would be interested, but he plays sports during this. Is this a full time sport where you can play? For your, like if you have a kid that likes to play hockey, can he do this and play hockey? No, because the, the practice times and the matches would conflict with, with our sport. So I right. would have to miss hockey to compete with that sport. Now, have we had in the past student athletes play soccer and be the kicker for the football team? Yes, that has happened before. So um, that, I'm not saying that. I think that would be a conversation that we would have to have together what the policy of the district would be, but when you do have an athlete playing two varsity sports, that could create okay. problems. Sure. Thank you. Yep. I, I think the alternative to that, Mr. BB2, would be to create, um, if we have the rifles, we have the safe at the Rodney Young Club, why can't we do an ALO? Why can't we do some club? That may not be the varsity sport, but still offers the opportunity for the student athletes to participate, but they can still Basketball. I know my kid would love to go there every Saturday or Sunday and shoot a gun. Who doesn't right. like to do that? Right. And I think we do it like with basketball, for example. We do open gym with hockey. We have open skates on Sunday uh, to offer those opportunities, but it's not interfering with football, per se, or something. So that would definitely be something. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. So what makes an ideal rifle shooter? Um, I just have a quick uh, four-minute video um, where an Olympic athlete speaks to the skills and the traits that make a good farm. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. You can make it full screen too. Sure. Thank you. actually 
shooting perhaps at seven or eight seconds, you're actually not breathing, and that tends to bring your heart rate down and, and achieve that, that stillness. You also can't be very connected with the outcome. Once you have that psychological pressure, it leads to a lot of physiological reactions in your body. And your heart rate increases, for example, your breathing rate increases, and all those aspects uh, play a huge role also in the system of the shot. The most success at the moment we see is between the age of between 20 and 25. When you're younger, you have a little bit better reaction time, for example. Just where the sport is heading, it is a physical condition and does certainly play an impact. But having said that, you still get all types of people uh, competing. You could have an advantage uh, when you have a longer bone here. If it's longer, then you just have the ability to rest on your hip uh, in an easier way without compensating with your back. So I would look for those structural advantages, if any. But having said that, I don't think that there's a real advantage anywhere. I think at the end of the day, it all boils down uh, to determination, dedication, and hard work. You can have talent, you can have a little bit of advantages structurally here and there. At the end of the day, you need to find that deep um, will and that deep desire um, and that deep courage from within yourself to be able to go out there and succeed. going to be on the cutting edge of something in the area that no one else is doing and we can be the pioneers of this and I looking at some of the demographics of the student interest form it does open up a demographic of students some students that may not participate in soccer or hockey or basketball uh, to an opportunity to represent their school and compete for their school and their community and uh, I'm really excited about the journey that we can have there right now so I appreciate your time any questions anyone may have? Thank you, excellent job. Can everybody hear from the comment? Reserve works. 
Um, the other reserve that we're going to increase tonight is the tax cert reserve. And this is used for litigation where um, companies are fighting their assessment guides. Um, so it's actually a litigation point and every year they can add a new, new lawsuit saying they're fighting their assessment. Um, we have, have a lawyer that we advises us whether we should or should not put money away for those. Brendan Owen, it, Owen is the, the lawyer we use. So uh, we, I work with him every year um, and we did not increase it last year. So we're actually doing two years this year. We're gonna do 2021 and 21, 22. Um, to increase the tax cert where it needs to be for the lawsuits that are pending at this point. Um, and that happens every year. We get uh, the same, usually the same ones, but every now and then we get a new one thrown in the mix. Um, so we go over all of those and see what it looks like as far as what kind of monies we should set aside just in case those lawsuits were to be won by those companies, which they were a couple years ago by the, the mall. Actually, we had to pay out the mall a significant amount of money. Um, so that's what that is there for in those instances where we do have to do payouts, that money's there. So again, we don't have to go to the taxpayers for additional lines. So those are the two big ones. And um, the rest of uh, our, our corrective action plan is, is, is in the report and speaks of our plan to help reduce that one now. This is the first step. Any questions? Fire safety rules to all students in Cumberland Head Elementary, and students went outside to see the fire truck, marine rescue unit, as well as firefighters in their full gear. Thank you to the Cumberland Head teachers, aide, and volunteer firefighter, Charlene Trombley, for arranging that opportunity. The student council, led by Charlene Trombley and Mandy Bishop, have met twice so far to plan their events for the school year. Coming up at, at the end of October is their spirit week. The student council chose theme days for each day of the week. The PTO is hosting a trunk or treat in October, and this event will allow students to trick or treat safely from trunks outside of the school. Look forward to that. So I have the elementary school at the main building as well, uh, sent to me by Ms. Barcom. Beamtown Elementary has been very busy getting the school year cranking. Students, families, and teachers have been very cognizant of safety protocols with regard to COVID-19. Teachers have begun to take students outside for snacks rather than in their classrooms. For those that choose to stay inside, teachers are ensuring six foot social distancing while students are snacking. The cafeteria and all-purpose room are working out well for lunch. Students are all six feet apart, follow the protocol of mask up, clean up. Student staff and visitors wear their masks diligently, and every classroom has disinfectant spray and paper towels ready to keep them sanitized. Wind time, which stands for what I need time, is going well. Intervention services began on the 22nd of September, following a great deal of baseline assessments and data-driven team meetings to best meet the needs of each individual student. 
Mary Swanson and the interventionists have done a great job ensuring the new MTSS plan is fall as well. We have successfully executed three fire drills to date, working closely with the middle school and the high school. Even the youngest of the population was quite efficient. Picture Day was a joy to have at Beacon Town. The students were very excited to be able to do this. Thank you to Bill Papper for being so efficient and patient with our little kiddos. Due to high enrollment in third grade and the need to socially distance in classrooms, a new third grade classroom was opened. The new classroom is in the art room, and Renee Wooster has been incredibly professional about providing art on a cart. Her creativity and thoughtfulness to the students' needs are quite inspiring. Lindsey Brown has been moved from intervention to provide the third grade instruction. Her new class officially began on the 8th. The students were excited with their new space. Ms. Brown was made a very welcoming and an exciting place to learn. Excellent job, Ms. Brown. The grade three classroom now has about 19 to 20 students and sharing a better socially distanced room. Thank you for each of the grade three teachers for making this happen so well. Now on to the middle school, brought to me by Ms. Principal Nelson. The middle school has had an incredible first month of school. Homecoming Spirit Week was a blast this year. Ms. Pizzaio and her student council members selected dress-up themes for each day. Google Meet Monday had the most participation by both faculty and staff. The week ended with our first Beamantown Middle School virtual pep rally. Students signed up for an event they wished to participate in and were selected at random to come down to the LGI for the ninth period pep rally. The events included Try Not to Laugh, a balloon relay, and the crowd favorite, Jeopardy. Mrs. Nelson would like to thank the EdTech team, led by Director Lambert, for helping Ms. Mazzaio to live stream the event. Student Council elections for middle school also took place during homecoming week. Each candidate submitted a pre-recorded video for the campaign, which was viewed by, during student advisory. Students voted by submitting a Google form to 20, on the 20, 20, 21-22 BMS Student Council. The officers are President Hayden Miller Wemple, Vice President Tristan Manny, Secretary Zachary Zeisloff, and Treasurer Lindsey Shanley. Uh, President Hayden Miller Wemple is actually on the cross country team and ran quite well tonight. In addition to student council, other clubs are up and running. The middle school has over 50 students participating in yearbook club, robotics, seventh grade class, student council, and B squad. Echo Community STEM Family Night is now going to be a day event due to the increase in COVID cases in the area. The Echo STEM Festival will take place on October 21st. Students in grade 4 through 7 will be able to rotate through five STEM stations set up in the high school gym. This is in partnership with the CFES Brilliant Pathways and the Gear Up Grant. The middle school counseling staff has been pushing into advisories facilitating the SEL lessons using the top 20 curriculum. Their first lesson was on what it means to be above and below the line. I remember that. <laughs> Lastly, the high school. The first month of school has been extremely busy. The Beacon Town High School faculty and students have done a tremendous job assimilating back to 100% in-person instruction, creating high-quality educational experiences daily that have been had the extreme safety of our kids, faculty, and families at the forefront. A major focus this year, as in years past, is the social emotional well-being of our students. Through our social studies classes, each student in the entire school participated in our Fast Bridge Social Emotional Screener. The screener is aligned to our state-mandated counseling plan and identifies students who may be struggling socially emotionally. Students who were reported at high risk or somewhat risk are identified, and our wonderful counseling team is meeting with those specific students to ensure that they have the support they need. Counselors have also already been pushing into English classes to conduct the top 20 social emotional curriculum that provides additional support for students that might be struggling. Ms. Rosario and Ms. Frechette conducted a virtual assembly to speak directly to students in the senior class on the postponement of prom going dance. During that virtual assembly, students were able to ask questions and Mr. Zio and Ms. Frechette were able to review all the factors that went into this extremely difficult decision. We 
also want to reiterate that it is a high priority to have prom in the spring for the seniors. We've had several opportunities for students to access college and career opportunities. First, we had Sergeant James of the Air Force and some Army representatives on two separate occasions to campus to speak with students who are interested in the military. Last week, we had opportunities for our students to speak with representatives from the following colleges through our counseling office. SUNY Canton, Albany College of Pharmacy, Casanova College, NVU, Lemoyne, Sage, and this week, Utica, and St. Lawrence as well. Students were also able to participate in the Virtual Manufacturing Day at Flint Community College and spoke about Flint Community College's Institute for Advanced Manufacturing, career opportunities in manufacturing, benefits and careers in manufacturing, and pathways from high school to Flint Community College to career. We also have stated our college planning events for students and communities. On September 20th, we conducted a night for information around college admissions and financial aid overview, which have planned a college application workshop for Thursday, October 14th. 41 underclassmen will be participating in the PSAT tomorrow, right here in the LGI. This will allow students to take an opportunity to experience the exam and obtain valuable data to help them when they take the actual SAT next year. Counselors will provide each student with their scores once received to ensure that they understand where they stand for the exam. Lastly, our building safety team that consists of teachers, staff, administration, counselors, SROs, and administration met last week to discuss fire drills, lockdowns, pulling places, and the reunification process. The team established roles and responsibilities for all members, as well as faculty in the entire school in the case of the emergency. There was a great collaboration and preparation for all the emergencies. Mr. Zio would like to thank our faculty and staff for the tremendous hard work they put in each day to ensure smooth, high quality instruction for our kids. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, well, so moving on to reopening, I was not at the last meeting because I was on vacation. So, Mr. Marin, would you mind updating the committee on that? Oh, sure. Okay. I've got a long list of here, so I'll try to summarize. Uh, all the principals have had their updates on everything from elementary rugs to um, you know, desk, desk is part of this. Um, we ordered more desks too, yep. uh, as well. And there's a lot of conversation on trying to keep the windows open as much as possible while the weather permits. Um, and the same thing with, uh, with buses, windows open for them. And, uh, and there was some conversation associated with as time goes by and it's colder, you know, we're looking at some procedures and guidance for how much we leave the windows open. So there was a discussion on that. Um, we ordered about 415 desks there, and uh, those needed to be assembled. I don't know. They're all, yep, they're all assembled. Um, Saturday, this Saturday, they're doing Beaton Town Elementary. The following Saturday, they're doing Cumberland. And I guess we also bought all the 13 picnic tables that were there, one of those. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> our, our students assembled those. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> All right, <coughs> uh, let's see here. So there's some feedback uh, from staff to the principals and to the people, which is really nice. Um, there were some changes in release dates and times uh, that were mentioned as well to accommodate the reopening. Okay, there was some discussion on snacks outside. Where, where was that with Bob? So it was in the report today that Riley mentioned, but it was just um, the snacks generally happen in sixth grade and under. Sixth grade has a different system. Um, the elementary, they're assuring six feet to socially distance if they're not going outside. If they're going outside, they're enjoying the outside. Or some, some people are piggybacking snack and recess as well. Right. Right. Okay. Um, we discussed also the, uh, the testing protocol. We'll start for uh, staffing. Yeah, the so the unvaccinated, the unvaccinated um, employees or contractors need to be tested. Need to be tested. So they yeah. require it. Right. Right. And uh, so let's see. That is, I, I just yeah. Okay, good. So this is something. We, so we do need to have another reopening committee. Meeting that committee works very very well. But um, we then we test drove. Uh, um, test drove uh, a test that we received from another vendor who was, I think, getting compensated by the federal government. And we found that our, uh, our test on this one test drive uh, was, we received the results back two days sooner, and it's less, there's less bureaucratic red tape in it. So not, not tomorrow, because testing, testing, there's testing here tomorrow, but next week, we're going to do a large batch of people who are willing to go through uh, this new test. Um, when we're going to tell them about the three or four benefits to this for them, and we may be going outside of the CVES and their process and utilizing our process. But we don't want to just jump ship if, if, if it's not better. I mean, if it's better, we're going to do it. If it's not, it's not. Well. It looks, the initial response is good. The other nice thing is, we wouldn't be on a timeline so that we could test any day we wanted to. So if somebody's sick, we're not, they don't have to go to a Sable or to CVS to get tested. And they're free across the board. Really? Oh, Correct. And it's still, a, it's a PCR test. It's a PCR test. Yeah. And the lab is vetted and their data is good. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, we send it by FedEx and the ones we currently use um, through the current program, we send it through EPS. Yes. So everything's, it worked well. Worked our initial, I keep looking at Mr. Pepe, he's done a wonderful job on this, and it worked well. It looks like it's something that we could also have a nurse's office for kids who have symptoms so that they can get tested, they can go in the batch, and then parents will have to worry about, you know, going home and then finding out. I mean, I have my kid who was sick, terribly sick, but uh, it was said we couldn't even get the results back on the COVID test. So it took forever. So this would be a much simpler, faster way. So the, uh, the 
Craig CBS uh, testing, what is the, what is the, the time on getting those back right now? Well, so Nick, let you take that one. Sure. We test on Wednesdays and Thursdays of this last week. Mm -hmm. And as of about 10 o'clock this morning, uh, 15 of the 44 tests have not been processed yet. Um, and each week there's always four or five tests that just never get, they never switch from in progress to, to a, a result. Um, mm -hmm. so, yes, we, we, so what we did, we, just a small sample, we had Cumberland Head building, um, eight individuals um, tested, they did both tests one after each other, and we sent them out at the same time just to compare. And there's this other company, that's Virginia Health, and they use OER Labs, um, and we got their results back on Saturday. Two, two days, two days. So two days or given that there's still 15 out of 44 that aren't in yet, it's three, four, five, six days or seven. It's, it's one, one, one snapshot. One snapshot, right. Well, that's a little concerning for the people that are vaccinated, right? That the results are not back timely? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so uh, do we have a policy where Okay, teacher A, B, and C did not get their test back uh, in a relative quickly time, and they're still left in the district because they're able to teach in the building or not. So, so I'll take that. Yeah, they're still able to teach in the building because the requirement is that we test them, and if this is the best testing mechanism we have locally, that's not their fault. Oh, that's great. That's, that, that's a good. I'm happy with that answer. I hope everybody else is. I mean, these, obviously, that's their choice not to get vaccinated. Right. So we're, they're doing what we want. Yep. They're, uh, following, they're doing the best they can. And, and perfect. We're trying to make it a little bit easier for them and more, more ways of just getting a faster result. It's less it's less uh, data input for them. And what was the other? And they can get tested any time. So if you're sick and you miss it tomorrow. Or this, this is a minor thing, but the, the current test you're seeing Yes, the clarified test. You're not supposed to eat or drink oh, yeah. anything other than water for an hour prior to the testing. Um, these current ones, they, they don't have that stipulation, and they also do allow for you to, you can use uh, your mouth or you can use the, your lower nostril, uh, more circles in each nostril, um, just so you don't worry about the food aspect. And we, do, we do tests in the morning at Cumberland Head right now currently, so that's, that's not, I know that not eating is not, or you can't brush your teeth off, so it's not always feasible. Um, and also, one big difference is right now, we don't schedule the testing. We go through CVDS, and Mr. Logan's doing a great job. Um, we are limited to what they can offer, and they, they maintain control of the tests. Um, the second company, um, we, we, can, we can schedule as we see fit. Um, we can be more flexible. Um, we've had a couple people that they miss testing for one various good reason or another, um, it's kind of a, a bit of a hassle for them to get a test elsewhere. Um, the second company, we would just control the test and give it to them right on the spot. Did, did you get any feedback as to, well, two questions, one of them is, is the rate of return for CBS improving for the last couple of weeks? Or We've only tested three times. The first week was a, was a complete loss. We couldn't get into the portal to see the results being done. It's not a CBS portal, that's the, that's the vendor's portal. Right, okay. I think they just got swamped across the state and just the best way I piece together some different questions I've asked. Um, that, well, this third week, we've, this is the most we've had um, this late that haven't switched from in progress um, to negative. Okay. And uh, what was the feedback? And CBS as to the reasons why you're still not getting all in progress. You mean test back quicker? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've asked, I haven't gotten any, any firm answer. Just the, they send them out, it's just a matter of, you know, there's delay in the test arriving. So I know that the second company, O'Hare Labs, that they arrived on, we tested Wednesday, I brought the box over with FedEx out. Um, they arrived, um, I think it's actually in Illinois on Friday, and results were done 4 o'clock on Saturday. So it's, so it's really outside of the local 
system. It's yes. Once it gets sent out. Once it gets sent. Once it gets sent out, it's it's totally the vendor that it's the. I think it's the vendor. Interesting. Okay. I've had that experience myself. My kid had one tested like three months ago, and it came back in two days. We know a family friend who they tested their child, and it took like six days to come back down. And I don't know why that is. Why? Well, maybe, obviously the maybe the demand isn't there, but uh, I don't think that's just a not the demand. <laughs> see, see, yeah, saying, oh, I'm sure it's probably not. Anyway, yep. three months ago you would get it back in three days. Now you get it back in a week, right? Yeah, sometimes it takes. But, but it, I think it, again, it just boils down to what vendor, what lab you're using, what, how many tests they can accommodate, and how quickly they're reporting. But to have 15 open tests just laid out, I mean, I, these are asymptomatic people, of course, so it's, it's less urgent. For a lab not to be able to close their PCR tests in three to five days is concerning. Right. You can test again tomorrow. Okay. So you're going to test again, and these people don't even have to test Correct. Them today. Oh. Yes, and you know, not everyone is thrilled with having a test, and this just adds another layer of why am I doing this? Which is fine, it's the, the law is the law, but it would be nice if people do want the results back in there. It is open to anybody in the district that vaccinated or unvaccinated is able to be tested. Um, so it would be nice if it was more, if people found it more efficient and more useful. You mean the second company that you're looking at? Oh. Currently, 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 right now. We, we have a few staff members who, who have chosen um, to test, even though there is not mandatory for them to do so. That's fine. And there's a transition also when we look at for students. Yeah, so the law that was passed effective immediately, which was back in September, <coughs> we needed to be able to provide asym or excuse me, symptomatic students the ability to test. And that option currently still does not exist locally. So we're gonna we're looking at doing that by next week. We were we were looking at Nick and I Obviously, we don't make decisions in the back. Right. We bring it to reopening. We're talking about it here in public. We're looking at trying to get that open by like next week. Part of it depends on the nice thing is this company will give you the they'll pay for shipping too. So, but we need the tests don't last forever. So we need like two or three the two or three times a week to ship. And, you know, if we get six kids at Cumberland Head that need need to get tested because we're sending them home, and then five adults or six adults, you know, that batch goes out. A big, a big part of the effort is to try to keep kids in school if they can. And you know, there's concern that they might be exposed and then they're out and they will be positive. And you can have them back soon. That's, that's best for education all the way around. Um, I, would, I would like to highlight that in the conversation at the meeting, he was impressed upon how much effort goes in by the staff at uh, identifying when the students come back testing positive and then identifying the students that are either next to them or around them from are at risk and, and having to create charts of people and classrooms on buses. And it's a really in, intensive coordinated effort. And I know that from what I remember listening, there are hours spent on each case and it's, it's significant. So, Really impressed, and I thank you for making that happen. That's really tough, tough job. Um, I know it was a conversation with a Santa Cruz leader, and a discussion, and a study that was be, that was done with uh, using Santa Cruz leaders in class, and they basically measured the amount of uh, carbon dioxide based on people being in there, whether they're helping. So that's kind of an interesting study going forward. Anything else that I missed?
fairly normal. And with COVID and the, redu the reduction in meals served, um, that was you know, a big portion of it. Um, basically, a discussion was had about how the district gets approved for the C with the CEC program. They, yeah. um, and how the funds for the pandemic EBT cards are, are um, determined. A lot of people have questions with me about that. Um, we just wanted to clarify. And we discussed the benefits of a community-based tax agreement and um, the Siemens Sustainability Education Grant Funds being used for planned use of the American Rescue Plan Grant Funds, basically a whole lot of funds and just talking about how we, um, we ended the year. And um, as already discussed, Mike Walrus uh, presented uh, the audit report, uh, which I mean, Basically, again, he said they have an unmodified opinion, uh, which is a good thing. The, the basic, the main thing to come out of that is that obviously we had that, we were over the limit for the, for the revenue. And that has to do with, we talked about the 20% state aid that we were, the cuts that we were anticipating and we were basically planning ahead. So um, the, the main point from that meeting and discussing the report is like the responsibility of the district looking at the future and with the, uh, as Jen Parliament said about the um, TRS reserve and the tax tour <laughs> reserve and how we're managing the money for the future for the teacher retirement systems and stuff. Um, and a big portion of the discussion was had about, you know, the again, making cuts that we did want to make, so that's why we planned the way we did financially. Um, we didn't want to go through the school year last year and then have to cut programs um, because we weren't going to have the money. So it was, uh, you know, we ended up with more than we expected, but uh, it's going to equal out. They have a plan, Jen referenced it, and it's on page 70. Any questions? All right, <coughs> next, on two minutes. The result of the superintendent's schools were recognized to the Board of Education to approve the following minutes. Motion. All options, Principal. Second. Second, yeah. yeah. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. CSU and CPSC, the result of the superintendent schools were commenced to the Board of Education to approve the CSC, CPSC, and 504 recommendations dated 10 13 21. Motion? Motion. Oh. Jeremy, second. I'll second. I'm good. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Can I just bring up? I lost track over the last couple of years because of COVID. <clears throat> I don't know, we kind of had that meeting. Uh, we have three orientation meetings. Uh, one is on CSC and CPSC. And if you haven't gone through that training and you want to go through that training, uh, Chelsea's setting that up with our assistant superintendent. So that's going to be, that's in the process. So I didn't know whether, you know, I know some of us are new, some of us are not new, but that training's available. Thanks. First I have, as all the superintendent of school requests the Board of Education and the following resolutions on this consent agenda, resignations, appointments, and retirements, we are hereby approved. Motion. Motion. Patty. Second. I'll second. Jeremy. Any discussion on personnel? Questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
discussion on what's happening. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed. Financial. Resolve of the Superintendent of Schools and the rest of the Board of Education that the following resolutions of this consent agenda, financial reports, internal audit, acceptance of grants, tax issuer, and TRS reserve be and hereby approved. A motion. A motion. Okay. Second. A second. Okay. Any discussion or questions on this <coughs> new session? All right. And this is the roll call. Douglas Peavy? Yes. Jerry Connor? Yes. Adam Flood? Yes. Cheryl McKenzie? Ed Mayer? Yes. Christopher Mishar? Crystal Farmer? Yes. Nicole Kapoor? Yes. Motion passes. Section 10. Additional items. This fills uh, a seat, so it doesn't it does go to the concern, it goes to the election as well. Uh, so it's not the same process as a regular election board member seat. All right, so now, hopefully, you guys have looked again at the only information on the website. Um, I'll start going through. Let's see. Everyone give me just the first choice. What you have, we'll go around the table, that lands us somewhere. If not, we'll go again. And, um, all right. No. I feel like I know Chris wanted to, but because of the way he advertised uh, this particular board meeting, he couldn't participate here at all. All right. So, Derek, who was your first choice? And, and by the way, a lot of these are really fantastic. Um, great background, and I hope that you try to participate in, in the school district in one or more ways. So, I that. Absolutely. Uh, my first choice is uh, Kimberly Erland. Okay.
Miller? Miller. Okay. Great. Me. Ms. Miller was the first choice. Okay. Um, Courtney Miller is my first choice again. Okay. Kimberly Erlich, did I get the test pass? It's my first choice. Okay. Courtney. Sorry. Courtney. Miller? Yes. Okay. Well, well, I gotta admit to you, I didn't know really anybody personally on this. Everybody had a great uh, reason for being on the board, which is amazing. So I'm not uh, Courtney obviously has four and Kim has two. So uh, we'll go with uh, Courtney because I, mean, I, I don't know anybody on there personally. So I, I have no I have no problem going with the majority of uh, Courtney. I really don't. Well, there were some really great letters. There's some of them has some fantastic backgrounds. Great, great feedback as to as to why you want to participate. It's real nice. And, so, all right, so what I have here, correct me if I'm wrong, I have uh, Ms. Erlin, I have two, one, two, three, four, five, four, Ms. Miller. Is that correct? Yes, yes. That is correct. Yeah. All right, so we'll call Ms. Miller. Is she here today? Congratulations, Courtney. Yeah. Oh, so, I can we just wear her at okay. right now? So Come on down. Of 
um, Wi-Fi and digital access to some the community because the current organizations don't have high plus place uh, cable the right place, whatever. I know I know people that the neighbors have it, because that's true, the neighbors have it, but no I can get into that. Um, so you got some great questions and so there's a there's an issue of access to students. I I do know that as far as New York State School Association, that resolution was brought in a few years ago and was passed to move forward to lodge the legislation. And it's been a big topic of conversation uh, at the state level to try to address that, particularly <coughs> rural schools, there wasn't something involved with that. So it's not a, it's a concern, but I'm hoping that will continue to highlight it. And thank you to Mr. Lambert and the EdTech Department for um, responding to my inquiry about, I was trying to figure out how many students do not have reliable um, high-speed internet in the event that we have to do anything remote again. As I mentioned, there's the rural schools in the New York State Public, um, the New York State uh, School Boards Association are great places. But uh, we've had Bach, um, the direct contact to our lawmakers. And I would say that they are going to be allocating large sums of money to fix this problem. And unfortunately, a lot of times they're gonna look at, oh, Beacon has such a wide, you know, so many students, this isn't a problem there. This, they, don't, they don't look at it like all, oh, everybody gets it, right? So bringing that to their attention that we have pockets in our community that still need it, that would probably service those pockets, you know, Saranac borders right up there too, and mm -hmm. those families as well, and NAC's on the other side of that. So I think some direct contact will work well to be worked on together as well. Yeah, I hope so. I know that one of the, one of the problems that, I, that were, was expressed was that these companies don't want to invest a tremendous amount of money to bring, bring the service just two homes to the return of investment in there, but then it's, you know, it's not fair for them and their people, so it is a challenging problem. Okay, district wide school safety plan. I, I talked about that already, so. Is that, yeah, sure. All right, so we'll cover that. Is there anybody else here for public comment? They might have come in the way to get it all. Moving on. Probably something obvious, but if you wanted to give public comment on the district wide safety plan, is it like um, like a web based place to do that, or how does one give, or they come to the meeting on the, the next meeting to give comment there? Yeah, so you could send an email, you could send an email to myself or come to the next meeting. That meeting will start earlier, that doesn't mean board members need to be there earlier. It's, it'll be a public, you know, open to the public to come voice and question. Go ahead, discussion. Discussion, thank you. We're going to be inviting uh, Kevin 